Sudan's transitional government and rebels have agreed to hand over those wanted for atrocities in the Darfur conflict. So does this mean former leader Omar al-Bashir will be sent to the International Criminal Court in The Hague? This is Inside Story. Hello there and welcome to the program. I'm Nastasia Tay. Now, one of the International Criminal Court's most wanted people may soon face trial. Former Sudanese President Omar al-Bashir is accused of atrocities in the western Darfur region. In 2003, Bashir sent in soldiers and militias to suppress mostly non-Arab rebels. The UN believes fighting famine and disease has killed at least 300,000 people there. Bashir denies the allegations and has escaped previous attempts to send him to the Hague Tribunal, but he is now no longer in power. And Sudan's transitional government and rebels in Darfur have now agreed to hand over all suspects wanted by the ICC. Justice is served by justice. We cannot bury our heads in the sand against the crimes against humanity and war crimes committed against innocent people in Darfur and elsewhere. Justice will not be served unless those with arrest warrants appear before the ICC. We also agreed on a special tribunal for those crimes committed in Darfur. It will be a special court entrusted with investigations and trials in these cases, including the international criminal cases. Now, Omar al-Bashir was the first sitting head of state to be charged by the ICC back in 2009. The court says that people in Darfur were murdered, tortured and raped, all under his instruction. It says the charges amount to war crimes, genocide and crimes against humanity. Bashir denies the allegations and says the court has no legitimacy. Bashir's government protected him for more than a decade. But that changed when he was removed as president last year and then jailed for corruption. Four of his closest aides, ministers and military commanders are also accused of war crimes and crimes against humanity. Well, let's bring in our guests now. Here with me in the studio in Doha is Walid Madibo. He's president of the Sudan Policy Forum, who focuses on governance and development. In Sudan's capital, Khartoum, Samahe El Mubarak, who is spokeswoman for the Sudanese Professionals Association. And also in Khartoum is Kenneth Roth. He's the executive director of Human Rights Watch. Thank you for joining us and welcome to the program. Um, Ken, I really want to start with you because I believe that you just walked out of a meeting with the head of Sudan's transitional government, um, Abdel Fattah al-Burhan. Do you think that this is a real commitment on the part of Sudan's government to actually send Omar al-Bashir to be tried by the ICC? Well, I should say I, I just, um, within the last few hours, met both with Prime Minister Hamdok and with General Burhan, who, as you note, is the chairman of the Transitional Sovereign Council, the 11-member combined military civilian body that serves as, in essence, the collective presidency mm. of Sudan during this transitional period. Now, um, I think it's important to kind of look at the language. Yesterday, one of the civilian members of the Sovereign Council said that um, Bashir and the other four who have been charged by the International Criminal Court would appear before the International Criminal Court, leaving open whether that means surrender to The Hague or whether some arrangement might be made to appear before the court in Sudan. And I think we don't really know the answer to that yet. So we um, could General avoid Burhan extradition was, here, potentially. Um, well, in others, I think it's important to understand that the International Criminal Court is a so-called complementary body. Um, if you look at the Rome Statute, its founding document, it prioritizes domestic justice, mm. so long as domestic justice is vigorous and fair. So, you know, Sudan would be completely complying with the International Criminal Court if it were to mount a genuine prosecution of Bashir and the others within Sudan. Now, is it capable of doing that? We don't really know yet. But the good news is that today, General Burhan um, pledged 100 percent cooperation with the International Criminal Court. He went so far as to say that he would welcome the ICC opening an office here in Khartoum. Yeah. Um, now, this cooperation, though, doesn't necessarily mean that Bashir is sent to The Hague. There are other ways to cooperate. What you know, it's going to require looking at, and I think it's just too early to say, is do they defer, does the Sudanese government defer to the International Criminal Court judges to decide 
whether a genuine domestic prosecution is proceeding or not. Indeed, will Sudan even attempt to mount a domestic prosecution, or will it simply hand Bashir over to The Hague? And it's just too early. We don't really mm -hmm. know the answers to those questions. Burhan also, and this is also good news, stressed the importance of um, looking at justice across the board. Because mm -hmm. I think, as you noted in the opening, um, the International Criminal Court has really only pursued um, crimes in Darfur, and indeed only the relatively early days of the Darfur conflict. There were atrocities committed in Darfur later. Mm -hmm. There have been other atrocities committed in the Nuba Mountains, in South Kordofan. Indeed, even in this last year, there have been arguably crimes against humanity, the, the large-scale killing of protesters here in the capital. Mm -hmm. um, all of these are beyond what so far the, the ICC has looked at. Um, Sudan seems determined to mount a special court, a special prosecution effort that can look more broadly, at least at the most senior officials responsible for the most severe crimes. They haven't done this yet. But um, there does seem to be a, 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 at least a verbal commitment to move forward. Mm -hmm. That's good news. We now have to hold them to that. Well, let me throw this now to Samahe, who's also sitting in Khartoum, because you're from the Sudanese Professionals Association. You were part of the lobby for this transition. And there has been talk of this tribunal being set up. But I also know that there have been concerns about the capability, the capacity of courts in Sudan to, to try something like this, and also concerns that it could further inflame tensions. Um, what's the Sudanese Professionals Association's take on all of this? Well, uh, what happened yesterday in Juba is a very important step forward towards uh, peace, as justice and peace are synonymous. Uh, it's very important at this stage to recognize uh, that the crimes that have been committed against humanities in Darfur uh, ought to be prosecuted. And, and it's quite important to recognize it, that it's the right of, uh, of the armed resistant groups to insist that this step is taken at this point of time mm -hmm. uh, and not to delay such decision. Uh, and it's also important uh, to note that uh, these are the cornerstones of, of the revolution from day one. It's freedom, peace, and justice. So to, to proceed further, uh, but as uh, Tim has mentioned, it's not just the crimes in Darfur. Since 89, there are many atrocities and mm -hmm. many crimes and numerous massacres and uh, crimes against humanities that have been uh, committed against the people of Sudan. So it's important uh, not to neglect these crimes as well. Uh, it's an entire process of transitional justice that needs to take place. And, and this is just a step in the right direction. It's a step forward towards um, recognizing the value of justice towards uh, the transition process. OK, I do want some clarity here, though, on the capacity of domestic courts and a tribunal that could potentially be set up in Sudan to actually process some of these cases. Let me ask you that question, Willie. Does Sudan have the capacity to, to mount something like this? Uh, not at all. I, I just want to say that uh, whatever uh, Mr. Taishi said yesterday, uh, was very reasonable, yet the wording itself is a, a little bit vague. Uh, it's, it's an administrative decision. Uh, the current regime should, should just give directives to the uh, law enforcement uh, agencies to bring uh, those uh, criminals uh, to justice and to submit them to the ICC. The, I uh, totally believe that the, the system, the Sudanese judicial system, until 1989, it had the institutional capacity, it had the integrity. Hmm. But now, after 1989, the Islamist uh, regime has systematically uh, 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 de destroyed the system. The system now doesn't have the institutional capacity. It doesn't have the integrity. And at that time, the regime was unwilling to cooperate with the international community. Sure. And this is what led us to, uh, it, it led the United Nations to take this, this, uh, the decision, the decree of 1593, mm -hmm. uh, which referred this whole case to the ICC, even though that Sudan is not part of the ICC in the sense that it, it signed on the law, but it wasn't ratified by the, uh, by the Sudanese parliament. Sure. I, I don't want to get too lost here in, in, in the minutiae of it all. I, I, I guess I want to look more broadly at the 
potential for further division to be sowed in Sudan through a transitional justice process such as this one. I mean, we saw when when um, al-Bashir was sentenced to prison during his corruption trial, there was a huge amount of support for him still in Sudan. Could this foment more division in Sudan, Walid? Uh, whatever it takes, uh, 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 the, the Sudanese government doesn't have an option. Uh, mm -hmm. A decision has already been uh, taken by the UN General Assembly. Uh, the whole thing was referred to the ICC all what the Sudanese uh, community, political community, could, could do is to comply with, with that decision. So there's, there's, there's no point even discussing this whole thing, politicizing it or trying to uh, ideologize the whole process. OK, L let me throw this back to Ken, because, Ken, the man that you met today, uh, Mr. Burhan, he was also accused of atrocities in West Darfur. And there are a number of people within the government and the Transitional Council at the moment who a lot of the protesters regard as having been complicit in what took place in Darfur. Is there a move or any kind of sense that they will be held accountable for their actions in addition to those currently on arrest warrants um, that have been issued by the ICC? Yeah. I mean, there's no question that there are many military officials who would like to see no justice done because they fear for their own future, their own liberty. But, um, you know, those who say, oh, just sweep justice under the rug is too complicated. Let's move forward. You know, don't understand how you build democracy. Mm -hmm. You can't build democracy around impunity because that just suggests that you can commit more mass atrocities tomorrow and that'll happen. You know, the only way to really build the rule of law is to make clear that the most serious atrocities, those responsible for them, will be brought to justice. And this is not an impossible task. I mean, one thing that's very impressive here in Khartoum is seeing that, you know, just recently, this was a military dictatorship, but today they are accepting a democratization process because of the massive popular support for the effort. Over and over, you've seen, you know, huge numbers of people take to the street, and the military has basically recognized that it can't just shoot all the Sudanese. It's going to have to accept a democratization process. And one element of that is the rule of law. And I think that that accounts for why today General Burhan gave us, you know, very strong verbal endorsement, not simply of cooperation with the International Criminal Court, but also with the need for a broader justice effort through a special tribunal established in Sudan that indeed would look at atrocities in Darfur and around the country that have been committed over the last three decades. Ken, you mentioned the word impunity there, and I do want to go to Samaher on this, because Samaher, you were in the streets of Khartoum as part of this popular movement, and there is one man whose name doesn't appear on an ICC arrest warrant, and that's Mohammed Hamdan Dagala, or Khmeti, who is now um, very much a part of this transition process. And he was... Well, he's widely um, acknowledged to have led the Janjaweed offensive back in Darfur. Um, will he be held to account? Uh, well, uh, at this point of time, as uh, Tim has mentioned, it's, it's all up for um, the investigations that are going to be taking place. And it's the people in the streets who are pushing forward, whomever it is, whether it's um, Hamad Hamdan Dagalo or whether it's El Burhan. Uh, as we proceed further and as this process is set on track, Anyone and anyone who is held accountable and anyone who it ha has been involved or have been involved in this process should be taken for trial. And uh, it's, it's very important to note that now, an, a year, more than a year uh, after, since the uprising has started, mm. people are still out in the streets. We're still out in the mm. streets pursuing the main three points that we've come out for, which are, again, I repeat, freedom, peace, and justice. Mm. And that includes everyone, non-excluded, because we are at a state of rebuilding, rebuilding our nation, and we cannot exclude anyone mm. at this point of time. Walid, I see you want to join, join uh, in here. Uh, yes, please. I just want to point out uh, the, the fact that even though we discuss this broadly, Sudan penal system doesn't have, that of 1991 doesn't have any provisions by which it can incriminate uh, people who committed uh, crimes against humanity or genocide. But having said this, I think uh, we ought to be careful. There is uh, a legal and a political process that needs to uh, uh, take place here. Mm -hmm. Once we submit those 51 uh, criminals, and it has happened. There are some people who have already, uh, th there is a precedence here. Uh, Abu Garda went and uh, submitted himself to the ICC. Mm -hmm. He was interrogated here uh, and, and he came back. Kenyatta, it happened to him. So I think once we su succeed in submitting 
the, these 51 uh, uh, individuals, we can start thinking about some sort of uh, retributive or re restributive uh, form of, of justice. But I think we ought to look at this uh, in a risk cost uh, analysis situation. If we don't submit these criminals who have influenced the killing of 400,000 human beings in less than four months and, and destroyed uh, 400,000 uh, 4, villages, if we don't do that, then uh, we are going to run a very high risk of the whole political process falling apart. And if that happens, God forbid, we will get into a civil war. Well, let me talk a little more about that political process. And I want to ask Ken here, because I know that Human Rights Watch has been documenting atrocities in Darfur that were even taking place after um, Bashir was ousted in April. What is the situation like on the ground in Darfur now? Well, I actually just spoke to people from Darfur yesterday, and there continue to be serious abuses committed. Um, violence, including sexual violence, particularly targeting some of the people who are um, the displaced people who are in camps who already have been um, displaced from their homes. So, you know, this is not just a retrospective effort. Um, there are ongoing problems today. The government doesn't even control all the territory of Sudan. So there is a real need to go forward. You had asked about um, Hemdeti and, and Hemeti, and um, I met yesterday with the person who is leading the investigation into the June 3rd killings of the sit-in protesters, the pro-democracy protesters, mm -hmm. a, a massacre that appears to have been committed by rapid support forces under the direction of Hameti. Of Hameti. So um, yes, he you know, could very easily become a target. This is, from what I can tell, a very genuine investigation. It's one of a number of things going forward. Um, but this is the new Sudan. It's not going to be easy. There is the need for international support. Mm. But I think the Sudanese people broadly recognize that, you know, for this transition to succeed, it's going to need to proceed with these efforts at justice. Well, you talk about this new Sudan and the spokesman for this new Sudan in Juba at these peace talks, he was the one who said that they would send people or they would have people appear in front of the ICC. And I'm, I want to ask Samar here a little more about this because there was a military contingent that went down from Khartoum as part of that delegation. I see Hameti was slated to go, but he didn't show up. Um, but does the presence of the military there, does that suggest that this decision has their support. So they are going to go along with it. Yes, definitely. Uh, this, uh, the, it's, it's right now, it's a process of, of a partnership that uh, the government has been in. It's both civilian and military. And, and it's, it was the only way to proceed further. So uh, the decisions are taken, are taken together, whether it's the military component or the civilian component together. Mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're trying to proceed further as one body. And uh, Tim can affirm here uh, the fact that he met with Burhan. He has also met with Hamdok. And uh, mm -hmm. this is the, 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 the direction that we've, we're proceeding in together as Sudanese people uh, with all components. There might be a few, uh, excuse me. Uh, this is how we're proceeding further. I believe mm -hmm. that uh, both agree. OK, I, I do want Both to take a little bit of a step back here and look at the context of the transition more broadly. So Sudan obviously needs a huge amount of funding to get back on its feet. Um, there's a huge economic crisis, amongst other things. And in order for that to happen, Sudan needs to be taken off the US list of state sponsors of terror. And um, there's been a bit of a campaign to get that done. I mean, we've even seen Burhan meet with Israeli um, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu very recently. And even though the, there are long-standing animosities there. so. On Monday, we also heard from the UN Secretary General, and he was addressing the AU summit just this past weekend in Ethiopia, and he called on world leaders to change their attitude towards Sudan. Let's take a listen. I want to say loudly and clearly it's time to expunge Sudan from the list of states supporting and funding terrorism and instead drum up international support that will enable the country to overcome its challenges. Ken, do you see this ICC decision as part of that campaign to try to get a, a high level of, of legitimacy? Well, there's no question that the more positive human rights steps that the government takes, uh, the more kindly it will be looked upon by those in Washington who are making this decision about designating Sudan or continuing to designate it as a state supporter of terrorism. I actually met with uh, the head U.S. official in Sudan on um, well, yesterday. 
and, um, and asked these questions. And what he said was that, you know, what Sudan would have to do is three things. I mean, one is to, to stop supporting terrorism. I mean, he wasn't able to provide any ongoing evidence of support, but that was one item. Mm. Two, that they have to make a, a credible commitment not to support terrorism. And then third has to do with, um, there's basically a lawsuit in the United States from victims of terrorist acts. It was a default judgment of, I think, a billion dollars entered against Sudan. And so some solution has to be found to that. But I think against this backdrop, it certainly helps the more positive human rights steps that the Sudanese government takes, the more it doesn't look like a supporter of terrorism and the more you will get broad mm -hmm. U.S. support to lift that designation, which indeed does stand in the way of the economic resources that Sudan needs to mm -hmm. make this transition successful. Waleed, I, I want to ask you, because this whole ICC um, decision was a key demand of the protest movement, and that was primarily being driven in Khartoum. And you yourself are from Darfur, a very different demographic there. How is this being seen in Darfur? Um, I think there is unanimous agreement that uh, we don't have any option but to bring those uh, criminals to justice, and the people don't have... Uh, much trust in the, uh, in the institutional cap 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 capability of the mm -hmm. uh, national judicial system. So I, I think uh, people would definitely uh, agree with this decision. But I, I, I want to just look at the, the, this whole thing of Burhan versus Hamdouk. I think the, the Hamdouk uh, has been totally co-opted by the uh, by these military officers, mm. and I, I I don't think that uh, th there is some sort of uh, a distance or independence between the civilian component of the government and the military component of the government, but they don't have an option because uh, if you look at Hamdouk's government, this is an ideological uh, minority that is suffering to pass uh, some serious decisions. The decisions here are basically and um, primarily political. The challenge is mm. political, bringing in the majority of the Sudanese people uh, to this, uh, to this uh, platform, to this civilian platform. Because soon as uh, Jabha Thawriya or the, the Revolutionary Front uh, was uh, pushed away by the forces of freedom and change, I think right there we, we had an ideological di division that cannot easily be recovered. And that's why it seems to me that they are very keen of making some amendment to that kind of uh, political misconduct. Walid, you're talking about division, but Samahe was talking very much about how the civilian and military sides of the government were actually working very well together. So let me give you the last word here, Samahe. As an activist and as someone who's been very involved in this entire movement, let me ask you very briefly, are you personally optimistic about the future of your country? Definitely. Um, uh, I'm very optimistic. Uh, it's understandable that there might be some turbulence and uh, here and there. Uh, there might some, be some problems that arise and resistance to change definitely in some places may arise. But I'm very optimistic that things are going to go uh, towards a proper transition and that we will overcome all these challenges. Well, lots of challenges indeed. Um, well, and we'll clearly be watching this very, very closely, and I'm sure we'll all get a chance to speak about this much more in future. So thank you to all of our guests here today. That's Walid Madibo here with me in the studio, Samahe El Mubarak in Khartoum, and Kenneth Roth from Human Rights Watch, who's in Khartoum today. And thank you too for watching. You can see this program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, do go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And you can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle there is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Nastasia Tay, and the entire team here in Doha, bye for now.